Okay, awesome. Uh, that is the title of my presentation, working with our archive, computational literary studies and Peruvian narrative. First, my apologies, because I admit that this is not Mediterranean. Uh, although I hope we can have a fruitful conversation at the end of this uh, first part of the panel. First, I want to give a um, theoretical introduction about what is the current status of our different digitization projects in my country, Peru. I am from Peru, although I am researching these uh, digital projects from the United States. Uh, and I want to explain a little bit what is the current status of all these digitization projects related to uh, literary heritage. I am not talking about all digital projects in Peru, but I am focusing on the digital uh, archives and data repositories uh, related to literary heritage because I am a specialist in literary studies. Uh, to give this uh, or to, to give this brief introduction, first I want to introduce two concepts from the archaeology of knowledge uh, by Michel Foucault. And talking about the, the, the work of the historian, he introduced these two concepts, the document and the monument. There is a, uh, a, a reflection about how the historian go from the document to the monument or vice versa. However, I only interest in, the, in these two concepts because it let me explain uh, how the, these different digital projects uh, analyze or include the text in, this, in their own uh, goals. First, uh, the idea of a document, and I, again, this is a concept by Michel Foucault, is, a, is a, an event, a literary text. It can be a, a art, a painting, for example, that is meaningful, and it, this meaning is useful for a narrative. Uh, that basically means that it is a, here a reduction process because although this object can be multiple meanings, it was reduced to only one mean, only one meaning. It's one dimensional, uh, and this meaning is used to support a specific uh, narrative. It means that the importance of the document, the, docu the importance of the event, the important of the importance of that literary text is not itself. It means it's not important because it's an important object. It's important because support a specific narrative. That's the idea of that document. I want us to relate the idea of document to reduction to a one dimension and to being useful for a specific narrative. The idea of a monument is something that uh, is not reduced. Really it have a multiple dimensions uh, it can, that can be explored in the future. Uh, and is productive not because support a specific narrative, indeed it's not related to a specific narrative, but is productive, productive as it is. It's, it's an object that is productive, it has multiple meanings and is waiting to be explored, is waiting to be analyzed. For Foucault, the traditional labor of the historian is going from the monuments, discovering something new, or if we are talking about uh, an expert on, on, in literary studies, uh, for example, a new literary text, and reducing the different meanings, reducing the different meanings into one specific meaning to support a specific narrative. Maybe, I don't know, uh, the traditional uh, view of the Peruvian literary history, for example. That's the, the idea of going from documents to monuments. Uh, my first idea, the theoretical component of this presentation is that nowadays in Peru, different digital archives preserve literary heritage as documents. It means that these different digital archives, these different uh, digital projects are preserving the literary text as, as a reduction uh, to support a specific narrative. I think it's important to explain what, what are these two narratives that are uh, prominent now in, uh, in, in my country, in Peru. The first narrative, uh, the title of this first narrative is Digital Efforts as a Response to the Impact of Technology on the Humanities. Now, right now it's happening something that is very similar to what is happening with uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence, AI, and companies. That basically like AI is trending right now. Different companies are in the, in the need 
of including AI into their own workflows just to show that they are trending and they are using this new technology. I think this is something that is happening around the world. It's trending and the schools, universities, uh, or companies, and including AI into their workflows just to show that, oh, we are also trending and we are doing this with AI. Something similar is happening with data archives in Peru. There are different efforts to preserve literary heritage, but without a specific goal. It's basically digitizing because they need to digitize. They need to show that they are using technology in relation to the humanities. I can give some examples. Uh, the first one it will be, um, this is Petro Peru. It's an oil extraction company in Peru that is uh, very popular. In, in the literary field because they have a, an award, a literary award from 1987. And they started digitizing the, it's a, a, a short story award. And they started digitizing all these short stories. That is interesting because you can see a whole arc from short story from the, the end of the 18, of, uh, um, from 1987 to nowadays. That's interesting to analyze, especially because they digitized not only uh, the winners, but also all the short stories that were uh, that participating in the in this uh, competition, and that's interesting because you can compare, you know, the, maybe the style, the topics of the winners, and the topics of all the or, other short stories, and maybe you can analyze the different trends in literary narrative in Peru. That's interesting. However, it's it, it's a digitization or digital project. That is not useful if you are a research because, researcher because it's not possible to download this information. It's not user friendly. Basically, you need internet if you want to access this, and it's very difficult to manage to access to retrieve. But to be honest, it's almost impossible. Is there in internet? It's digital, but if you are a researcher, it's basically impossible to use if you want to use a um, computational approach. And to be honest, if you are a reader is very difficult to read because it's not uh, reader friendly. Uh, that's the idea of using digital projects or using the technology to digitize only because it's trending nowadays in, in Peru and in other Latin American countries. Another example is this a group of researchers. They don't have a, like an institutional name that they are researching the poetry of uh, the Peruvian poetry at the beginning of the 20th century. A very interesting, interest, interesting project because they are really finding new uh, books and they are digitizing these books. And it will be very helpful for researchers. However, they are storing, they are preserving these digital objects in Google Drive and they are sharing their findings in Facebook. Again, it's, it seems like they want to digitize only because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's trendy, it's because they want to show that they know how to use these digital tools. But again, it's not useful, it's not helpful for researchers. That's the first narrative, basically digitizing books because uh, it's it's a, there is a need to show that, that they know how to use technology in relation to human, humanities. The second narrative is basically a replication of the last 100 years of literary uh, studies in Peru, the digitization of canonical works, just focusing on a few works, a few or also writers and digitizing these, uh, these books without expanding the knowledge, without expanding our tradition. It's basically a replication of what we already know about uh, Peruvian literature. We have these two narratives. It basically means that these digital archives are, are uh, analyzing or are preserving these literary texts as documents, as something that is meaningful only because they are supporting these two narratives, not because they really want to uh, know more about these texts. No, it's not because they want to preserve them to analyze and to show that there is multiple dimensions. On the other hand, uh, this project that I am the director, the Disasters and Celebraciones, from Disasters to Celebrations, uh, preserves literary heritage as monuments. I don't want to say that this project doesn't have a narrative. Of course, we have a narrative. Every digital project has, has a narrative and they digitize the books or any text or any work as part of this narrative. But I want to say that this, this kind of narrative, or part of our narrative is uh, working with the archive as a lab or working with the text as a lab. Our 
Second goal, the first one is, of course, the digitization of the novels published in Peru between um, 1886 and 1921. And we are meeting that, that goal for the reason we are we started uh, doing things to meet the second goal is working with this text as a lab, do some doing some experimentation in order to discover new meanings, multiple meanings in these works. Uh, the other idea about why I think this project has a monumental approach is that it's not an archive of canonical works, but it's basically an archive of any Peruvian novel published. In, uh, in Peru in this specific period. Again, I don't want to say that this project doesn't have a narrative because that's, that's a lie. Any digital project has a narrative and it's good having a narrative. And in this case, it's, an, it's good having a narrative that's, that collaborates in the exploration of the work, that collaborates in the discovering of multiple meanings, that collaborates in expanding our current knowledge of uh, the Peruvian literary tradition. That's something that is not happening with the other projects that have these other narratives and they are reducing the possibilities of the digital preservation. How I think we are doing this uh, monumental approach when preserving literary heritage. Uh, I think we, I can skip uh, this, this. Uh, slide. I mean, this is, basically we are including something that is very easy to do. Daniel, just yeah. ju just a, uh, a short remark. We cannot really see the changes of your slides. I just oh. really, yeah, I don't what know. About... What... Now, okay, now. Okay. So you now have to... you can see that we, I yeah, have yeah, the yeah, slide. Yeah. No, okay, okay. I, I can. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me know. Uh, um, we are doing something simple. Uh, to uh, start working uh, to do to have this digital archive as a lab, we are including not only the you know the, the file or the metadata, we are including plain text. That is something that is not difficult to do. I mean, all the all the other archives with the resources they have, they can do this right now. But they decided not to do it. They decided to include only the PDF. Sometimes PDF that is not readable, for example. And we decide, and in this case, this art archive decided, decided to include a plain text. That is the key component when you want to do computational literary studies. studies. Basically, plain text uh, is text that is ready to be analyzed, to be read, to be used by uh, any computational approach. That's the idea. When I include this plain text, it means that basically all these texts, we have around 40, uh, books right now, they are ready to be used, they are ready to be analyzed using these computational literary studies. That's the only thing that we, that's the thing that is uh, extra in this project, no? that is the, the component that I think is, is important to do this monumental approach to start discovering new things in the books. I want to do, I want to give, I want to present two examples about what is possible to do, what I am doing with this with this archive uh, and why it's important to, to do this extra step, to include this a small component that is the plain text, easy to do, uh, you don't need a lot of resources. It's ba basically, it can be time consuming, okay? But it's very important if you want to start uh, having an archive that is like a lab and you start discovering new meanings in the books. Uh, I, I, I want to present two examples of what to do or how to do it. The first one is exploring the first in the indigenismo lexicon that basically is a dictionary of the indigenismo. Indigenismo is a, a, a group of, it's not only narrative, it's art in general, but here is a group of narrative novels that explore the, or represent indigenous people in Peru. And especially they, uh, they represent, you know, that, the abuses, the exploitation of indigenous people in the Andes by the white elite in our countries in the Andes, like in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, but in this case, we are focusing in Peru. Um, I decided to explore if is this possible to have like an indigenismo lexicon, like a dictionary of important words used by these first indigenistas uh, novels at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. For the reason I use four books, four novels, three out of these four 
are included in the, the, the From Disasters to Celebrations archive, La Trinidad del Indio, Las Perlas de Rosa, and Churinanay. And the other one, you can see the blue star there, Aves in Nido by Grinda Mato de Turner. I think it's in another uh, digital archive. It's only a PDF file. It means that uh, as a researcher, I have to do there. I have to download the PDF. I has, I have to transform the PDF into the plain text. I have to clean the text. I have to be sure that everything is ready to be used or to be analyzed by the computational tool. Uh, it's not the case for the other three. Basically, again, they are ready to be used. You don't have to worry about cleaning the text. You only have to know a little bit of, of uh, computational literary studies. I analyzed these four. You can see that they were published at the, at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th uh, century. First, I decided to use a very simple uh, computational approach that is Boyan Tools. It's a web based open access. You don't need to know programming or uh, coding. Because again, our purpose as a project is. Uh, have these resources open for everybody, but also we want to do this computation as approach in an easy way. And for the and Boyant, basically, it's very easy to do. The only thing you have to do is uh, upload the text. And to be honest, this first approach is not uh, fruitful enough. I mean, the ideas that we can, the conclusions that we can get from using only Boyant uh, is, is not so interesting. Uh, that basically means if you want to start working with a, with this text, with the archive as a lab, uh, you need first a plain text, but also knowledge in computing or coding, more than only using a web-based open access uh, computational tool as Boyant. For the reason I decided to use uh, RStudio, you can do interesting things with RStudio, and I decided to analyze or to define what is the most, the 15 most, so it's the uh, typo there, most frequent words by novel. Something interesting using our studies that I identified that a, a coincidence, a happy coincidence between these four uh, novels. Uh, a word that appears a lot that is prominent in these in this, in this four texts is words related to family like mother, son, father. And with this, we can confirm two things. The first one is at the end of the uh, 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, these novels, indigenous novels, used the family as a metaphor of the nation. And for the reason they use the words like home, father, mother, son, and they are very prominent in these texts. And at the same time, it means that the, indigen the first indigenism lexicon or dictionary has a paternalistic approach. If the nation is a family, the white elites, the basically elites with a lot of money and land, they are the father and the mother. And the indigenous people, they are sons and daughters. It is basically that these sons and daughters, indigenous peoples, the indigenous people, they are not entitled to decide about their future. They have to be educated by parents. For the reason there is a paternalistic approach. This idea is not new. I have to be honest with you. This idea is not new. However, uh, it's a new way to show and uh, to confirm something that we already knew. Something that is new, and I can see that I only have like uh, five minutes, uh, is, uh, is, is this novel. It's the first detective novel published in Peru in 1911. It's uh, El Menique de la Suegra. It's the mother-in-law uh, Pinky, I mean, you guess this one, not the Pinky, the mother in law's Pinky. It's a detective novel, and we don't know the author, the, the writers, because in the introduction, uh, it states that it's a group of 10 different writers who published it, uh, the, who re wrote this novel. That, that's interesting. It's not only one writer, it's 10 of them, um, but we don't know the, who is uh, the, the authorship, who is the people that are behind this, this uh, detective novel. That's interesting to know. It's not after 100 years, it's not possible to know. However, if we use a computational approach, uh, we can try to understand who are these, uh, these people. I, I decided to use a stylo that is a, a package in, um, in our studio. Um, with this package, we can analyze the text. Something that I, have, I had to do first was this novel was published in eight, 
chapters, but also in uh, 13 installments, because it's a novella de folletín. It was published not, not as the whole book, but by using installments, 13 installments in one specific magazine for more than one year. And I decided to, to use the style of package in both cases. You can see with uh, eight chapters, basically it's saying that chapter seven and five was uh, were written by the same author. And if we follow that idea, we have only one, two, three, four, five people. And the introduction said that if we have 10 of them. It means that it doesn't work. If we use the installment, installments to analyze the text, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like nine people written. Uh, writing this novel. For the reason I decided to use the installments because it's closer to the 10 uh, writers in the, that it was established in, in the introduction. I have a suspect. Uh, I have the idea that Clemente Palma may be the author. And when I analyzed this, I could, I could understand that uh, this, here you can see three Clemente Palma's uh, texts uh, that they are very close to installments 1, 12, and 13. But basically, it's possible, it's probable that Clemente Palma wrote the first and the last installments of Femenique y la Suegra. Uh, I try to do this with other authors, and basically the, the analysis shows that they are not, it's like that whole novel, Femenique y la Suegra, is, was written for a specific, for one author, and these other authors that are included, they are like not related. Clemente Palma is the only case that is close to the style because basically this program is uh, comparing styles. And this program shows that the styles, the Clemente Palma styles is very close to the first and the last installments of Fermín y Quela Suela. It means that it's possible, of course, I have to do more research in order to uh, support, in order to confirm this idea. But this is possible to do only because we are offering this plain text only because we are uh, working with the, the archive, we are analyzing, we are preserving the text as documents, as something that can be analyzed in the future using this plain text. And also because there is a knowledge of computational approaches. That's something that is important to start teaching in uh, not only in Peru, but in basically in Latin America, there is a lack of knowledge on what to do uh, with this plain text and with these computational approaches. Uh, that's all. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, hearing my presentation, and I will be happy to answer your questions uh, later today. Thank you so much.